uh, historically, Sophos uh, has been uh, a, a channel company that uh, really kind of drove uh, business out of Boston and Vancouver. Uh, a few years ago, we started hiring people um, out in the field. I've worked for Sophos for eight years uh, as tech support manager and, and now a sales engineer. Um, so it was an easy win because I live in Ohio to take over Ohio. Um, to that, we added Dolph Smith. He's um, been a sales engineer, a sales engineer manager, and now has gone to the dark side of sales. Uh, he couldn't join us today because he's doing something similar to this in uh, uh, Cincinnati today. Uh, so we're kind of split up. That's he and I kind of Thelma and Louise, a lot of these kind of things. Um, and then Ben Maloney is a, a handsome, strapping young man who works in our Boston office and is kind of, uh, if you have questions, he's a good point of contact because he's there about 10 hours a day. Um, so you can pick up the phone and, uh, and talk to him. Um, so that's kind of the, the team uh, for Sophos. So um, when I became a sales engineer, they gave my sense of humor back to me from tech support. So you'll find I have little pieces of humor uh, weaved in here. So lies, damn lies, and statistics, a quote by Mark Twain. Um, by that, what do you think uh, eight might represent in terms of internet security? So eight new devices joining the internet every second. So you can just eight, 16, I can't count by eights. Um, so uh, if you guys can, I, that's great. But uh, about every second, there's uh, eight new devices, roughly. Um, what do you think 30,000 might represent? Anyone? That's a good one. Yeah, that's actually, that's fairly close. Infected websites a day. That, that's where, what we're detecting at Sophos, about 30,000. The numbers are getting bigger. What do you think that represents? This is actually a really old number I need to update. What do you think that represents in terms of Sophos? That's samples of brand new malware that we see a day. And that's every day, even on New Year's Day and Christmas Day and odd public holidays and other things. So. Where's all this coming from? What can you imagine? Historically, this is where it was coming from. So uh, people picture uh, the disheveled young man in the basement uh, with a grudge and he's hacking whatever, or he has some pride issue uh, where being able to hack a site or do some damage to somebody uh, or get access to something for him is you know, really, uh, that's an element of pride for him. Um, and historically, that was the case. Um, what we're seeing more today at Sophos is folks like this guy. This guy is so hip and so cool that he gets his picture taken with a sword. Um, so, and I can give you his name later. He's worth Googling. Um, Krebs has a number of good articles on him. Um, but long story short, he started a number of businesses which became very shady. And uh, one of those businesses is malware for hire. So anybody in here do software development or manage people who do software development or have ever met someone who does software development? Um, you understand there's development kits and you download those and you write the code and you output the program and oh, happy day. Well, this gentleman does the same thing for malware. So his organization goes ahead and writes a software development kit that you can buy, that you can get tech support on, and uh, then you can go ahead and uh, write your own malware and compromise machines. Uh, we'll look at some of the methods by which that occurs. But what we're seeing is a transition from uh, doing mal malicious acts for uh, pride into doing them for profit. And so that's a much more vicious driver and it appeals to a lot broader range of folks who now become criminals in a much different way. Um, and in a lot of cases in a, a much broader spectrum of folks uh, with a much lighter skill set because they can buy that, go compromise machines, they can send out spam, uh, that'll send it to other folks, they can create their own botnets uh, by which they can then hire those out to create denial of service attacks and so on. So we're really seeing kind of that, that change over the last really two years from doing things for pride and maliciousness to really doing things for profit. Uh, anybody remember their first piece of malware? Like everybody remembers their first kiss, but nobody remembers their first piece of malware. I remember my first piece of malware. It was the Joshi virus. It passed from machine to machine via floppies. Three and a half floppy goes in there, 
does a little something to the boot sector. One day a year that affects the machine. Rewrites the boot sector, pops up this, a screen that says, happy birthday, Joshi. That thing made it all the way from India on floppies. It was uh, pretty amazing. Nowadays, you can download these kits and you can be developing your malware this afternoon. So I won't be showing you how to do that, believe me. Uh, very much affiliate marketing. So appealing to uh, their downline, very much using the multi-level marketing you see over on the right there, where uh, if you get somebody on board, then you get some of their profits. You get a kickback, just like multi-level marketing has been for years. Uh, I won't mention any names because I don't really want to associate them with that, but I, a lot of us have heard those, you know, hey, get five of your friends and you get a downline and then you get profits. Um, heavily involved in, you know, your, your false or even sometimes for-profit uh, but illegal uh, pharmacies online. Um, so you go to a pharmacy page and maybe you do get some pills in the mail or maybe you don't. Um, so they're either spoofing you or uh, they're illegally selling them. Either way, they're doing that for profit. How do they get machines? How do they uh, start roping us in? Um, so with those folks, uh, really kind of one of the new areas that we see um, is beyond your typical Trojan, your typical virus, typical worm, some of these names that you guys know for malware. Um, and we've moved into what we call malvertising. So uh, I have a coworker in Indiana who loves to say that word. He'll say it like 20 times in this presentation. Um, we have the picture of the cute dog. I have one of those. He's, he's very ornery. And um, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and compromise an ad site, or we'll actually buy time on an ad site and instead of serving up stuff for a legitimate business that might have to do with camping or another hobby that folks are searching for, we're gonna start injecting redirectors to our compromised site. You're gonna go visit that site when you click on that link and now they're gonna do what's called hooking your browser. And with that browser hook, you get a pop-up and you say okay to it. That installs a JavaScript, a via JavaScript, uh, compromise to that browser and now you have access to that machine. And it's surprising what you can do with that machine once you have it. So we'll look at some of those here in just a minute. That's the number of malvertising impressions that we estimated in 2015. That's a lot of zeros. We had a, if we had a dollar, even if we had a dime for every time that happened. Uh, and that's really what uh, these folks are looking to accomplish. So malvertising is a relatively new way that we're seeing folks get into uh, machines, compromise machines. Another is uh, just walking in. So uh, this happened with a Sophos customer, customer in the Southwest. It's actually somebody I brought on board, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, somebody walked in uh, with a fairly large bill, wrapped around a USB stick and said, plug this in and I'll come back in two weeks with another one. And you know, I don't know how much money it was, uh, $200 or something like that. But you got somebody who's making minimum wage or just above that you know, checking somebody out at a restaurant. And like, why not? If somebody's gonna come back and, you know, give me $500 for just plugging this thing in, hmm, why not? It didn't happen. It bubbled up to the manager, the, the person at the checkout line was honest, and then that bubbled up to their manager and it got to the IT department and got to us. So uh, that was an interesting real world example of this dynamic. Um, so you can imagine for, you know, folks, that's a, a social compromise. Uh, that's also a security compromise uh, where uh, we're physically plugging something in to go ahead and uh, compromise that box, give access to a point of sale machine, which becomes our launch pad for other areas. So uh, just that social dynamic of being able to, to plug that in. Yeah, one of the things that, that and if you've heard me rant on the, when we do the annual IT events or, or annual IT trends, I think it was about two or three years ago where I started saying they've got a business model. It's not the technology. If we, if we weren't talking about security, we were talking instead of how we're gonna go to market with a product, we would all be talking about how great advertising this is and how this is great customer service, great customer satisfaction. And we would say whoever, the guy with the sword, um, and you can't go wrong with a picture of you with a sword, okay? You really can't. I need to get a sword. Yeah, yeah, I was just <laughs> thinking that. You know? But the thing is, is that's a businessman. That's an entrepreneur. And the problem is, is that a couple of years ago, they found out a way to make money. 
And this is a great incentive for people to come up with newer ways to make money. And as long as it was the disgruntled guy who I think was the uh, Penn and Teller, I think that was him, <laughs> that was the, the one guy. Uh, as long as the disgruntled guy was like, eh, it doesn't happen often, they're not gonna go for the small business, they're not gonna go for the smaller company. But now that they're finding ways to make money, it's a totally different ball game. Mm -hmm. And they're incentivized to do it better mm -hmm. than their competition, to do it better than the people trying to prevent the sales, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, infection from happening. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a totally different game than it was a couple of years ago. Totally different from a business standpoint. And to that, um, what we're seeing, it, jokingly at Sophos, we call it a digital smash and grab. Um, really, um, I, I stole this, uh, this quote, uh, actually just down the road, uh, that CISO, uh, he, uh, he had recently become uh, the, the CISO when I talked to him about Sophos, uh, particularly around our encryption product. But I thought that was just a really great, great quote from him in that, uh, you know, if somebody breaks into your house, you see the broken door, the broken window, and you see that the television's missing and other things are missing, and it's very, very obvious what's going on. Um, your car's missing, uh, those kind of things. Uh, whereas, you know, in a, a digital realm, uh, you may not know for a period of time. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the target attack, uh, target the reseller. Uh, and, you know, that was one of those areas where it begins slowly, carefully, methodically, and quietly, and it continues that way uh, on a single machine or many machines. So, um, and I'll tie that in a little bit more here as we go. Um, we also, you know, jokingly say, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto, your data, and those exploit kits um, on top of that, you know, so we have the malvertising, we have uh, the uh, for-profit uh, malicious code generation, um, and then the exploit kits on top of that. They're things that uh, we're able to download and then we can test and we can play with uh, to where we can uh, see how we can compromise a machine and see where our vulnerabilities are. And there's some legitimate ones. I'll bring out those again later in the presentation as well. But really, uh, look at wherever the um, exploits are. So um, just by a show of hands, who does patching in your environment? Oh, come on. Let's get enthusiastic. What's more exciting than patching? Come on. Patching with a sword. Patching with a sword. <laughs> That'd be that would be awesome. Yeah, I really, I'm really going to get a sword. Anyways, um, so with that, um, jokingly at Sophos, we have, you know, Microsoft has Patch Tuesday. Uh, well, then we have Malware Wednesday. Um, because on Tuesday, we're releasing patches for vulnerabilities, right? Uh, we're plugging the holes. So uh, over here to my right, we have a window. Uh, back there, we've got some doors. Uh, and really, that's kind of the major vulnerabilities for this room. If we don't want to keep someone in, we've got to watch those doors, and we've got to watch that window. And uh, if, we, if we want to really keep somebody out, we're going to wall those off. And that's effectively what you're doing with coding. Uh, when we find out there's an open door, well, let's, let's close up that open door code-wise uh, so that nobody comes in. Well, once we release those patches, we basically said, here's the open door. So if you're not frequently patching, that becomes the vulnerability uh, by which your browser is going to be compromised, your machine's going to be compromised, and they're going to do that through, again, a number of different means. Um, I suppose most of you recognize at least some of these icons. Can you guess which uh, might be the most often compromised of any of those? Flash. We got to vote for Flash. We got Windows Explorer, uh, Microsoft Explorer. I, Java. That's right. The answer there is Java. It is the most compromised um, because it is oftentimes the least often patched. Uh, we have a, you know, say a vulnerability um, that is tied to an application we've developed for a very specific version of Java, and we can't move on. Uh, so that's something that I, I encourage IT departments to drive within developers or with uh, vendors that you deal with is you know, keep current uh, versions of Java um, available to those machines that uh, use those applications. So and, and to interject on both Flash and Java, Flash and Java are applications that run on your computer and the goal is so that a website can actually control that program so that you, the user, can see something cool. 
you know, we used to have Flash a lot for animation or the like. So its intent is to actually remotely, give the ability to remotely run programs that are provided remotely, which is great if you're doing good things, which is really evil if you're doing bad. And the problem was is that everybody, when they originally created Java, Flash, Internet Explorer, all these things, they made it, they built them to be productive and to perform well. They did not build them to be secure. And so everybody has been patching, adding, maintaining, and especially Java, if you, you have applications that were written for this version of Java, they will not run on later versions of Java, which means that for that workstation, that workstation is running with that earlier version of Java, unless you, you know, do things to get around that. Why? Why, to go, why go to all this effort to get a machine compromised? Uh, this particular slide is uh, a bit of an eye chart, I know, for those of you in the back of the room, um, but uh, shamelessly taken from Krebs on security. So if you guys are familiar with that, it's a great security read on a regular basis. Um, but once we have a machine hacked, here's a whole diagram of what we can do with it, possibly. So uh, up here, we might turn it into a web server. And now we're serving out uh, malicious content. Um, that we're redirecting our malvertising to. It's something sitting right in somebody's house, and it's a web server on the internet. Um, perhaps we're spamming folks. So I think a lot of folks are familiar with the idea of uh, what we call snowshoe spam. If not, you've probably experienced it. Uh, let's stand up 12 compromised servers. Let's create very similar messages for each of those 12 servers. We have our email list. All of a sudden, those uh, 12 servers are going to come alive and start sending out their 12 slightly different messages to all that email list. And then that hits the anti-spam solution and whoever the recipient is, and three of them get through. And now they click on a link, and they're redirected to the compromised site or the pharmacy, they're trying to sell them who knows what, so on and so forth. Um, you know, some of my favorites too, you know, reputation hijacking. So identity theft, and so on. You know, so your Facebook account, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google, so on and so forth. If I can monitor your machine, I can probably know what you typed into any of those particular pages. Um, and then, yeah, down here, your, your fake antivirus, ransomware, and so on. I'll get into the uh, particularly ransomware here in just a few minutes uh, with that. So ransomware, who's familiar with, uh, with the idea of ransomware? I have a few hands. Anybody experienced it? Yes, very ugly, very, very ugly. Um, this is yet another illustration of the for-profit dynamic of uh, kind of the change in malicious coding out there. So uh, really, we are just doing extortion with this. So uh, if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, I didn't see everybody's hand go up. Basically, uh, a piece of malware lands on a machine. It goes out to the internet, and it gets an encryption key. Once it has that encryption key, it starts looking for important files, and it runs through the hard drive, finding those files, and encrypting them. Just like you might encrypt them to secure them, uh, but it's going to secure them away from you. And then it presents you with some kind of screen um, that says, you need to pay me this amount, uh, or we're just going to get rid of the key, and you'll be out of luck uh, with that. So. Uh, and what we're seeing today, you know, early on in the evolution of those ransomware products, uh, we were seeing even some of them just being fake, just panicking people and getting them to pay. They're not actually even encrypting anything. Uh, some of them were using very weak encryption. Some of them were uh, not succeeding in encrypting the files. Now we're seeing them uh, actually quite thorough. And now they're using a 2048-bit 20, key uh, to do the encryption. That's roughly twice what most encryption products use. Uh, to encrypt uh, their files. So unless you have supercomputers, you're probably not going to undo that uh, without actually purchasing it. We have a very complex threat chain. So by that, what I mean is there's a lot of pieces there that make it hard to catch an assailant when it comes to the uh, ransomware. Um, we have a social engineering component as well. Hey, click on this. We have the pop-up in the browser. Uh, perhaps we have an application that looks very convincing that somehow lands in the system tray uh, in the computer. And so that pops up. Uh, there's no need to stick around. 
Uh, so a lot of these compromises re require a lot of effort. Uh, this doesn't require a lot of effort. If I can get one machine compromised, I may well get my 250 or $500 out of that one machine and uh, folks get that back. Um, again, it uses existing tools. So kind of the tools we've been talking about where uh, it's pre-developed. We don't have to write any of our own code. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just bought the base. And we customize it to make it look and feel the way we want it to. Um, and now we're encrypting machines. One of the interesting points at Sophos 2 that we discovered uh, not too long ago is uh, one of the ransomwares uh, is actually geographically targeted. So most of uh, the former USSR, um, the states that came out of that, um, and a number of the stands, Kazakhstan and so on and so forth, uh, if you're in that geographic location, uh, several of the ransomwares don't affect your machine. They just pop up a screen, they won't encrypt your machine. So it's really targeted at North America and other uh, defined wealthy nations uh, out there. So it's a, a very interesting dynamic as well as we pull apart uh, malware. So think about it from the metaphor I was using earlier about product. They've improved the product. They've made it better. They've made it more appropriate to what they're looking to do. Their delivery model is more efficient. You know, it, it, it's now with Lemon. And again, that's the thing that scares me, is the fact that these guys are approaching it like it's a business. Absolutely. So how do we get there? Um, here's yet another. Um, so uh, one of the more recent versions uh, that you can read about uh, quite readily on the internet is Locky. So that's a, a ransomware. Uh, it's got a nice cute name um, and it's known for that because it actually changes the file extensions to dot locky so uh, it encrypts the file and changes that and uh, oftentimes how it gets in is a very old-fashioned way of uh, 10 year old maybe more uh, method of infection through a word macro virus are you guys familiar with Word macros? It's a way to automate elements within Word documents. Uh, you can see similar elements in your PDFs and uh, other products. So with that, uh, we'll get this garbled, ugly mess with a little thing that says, you know, enable macro if the data encoding is incorrect. And right up here, because there's macros in here, Microsoft Word has said uh, there's a security warning. You know, macros have been disabled. So the user will hit the options because that's what it tells me to do and uh, then I'll go ahead and turn that on. Uh, now I've allowed that to run by opening the document. Uh, that's going to execute some Visual Basic code that's going to install who knows what, which is going to then retrieve other items from the internet um, and go about compromising the machine. And that's actually how Locky gets there uh, for that. So uh, perhaps in your email inbox you may see uh, invoice from or invoice uh, by, that's a, a common one, is the word invoice. Uh, in that for Locky in particular. So, and with Locky, uh, the other interesting point is it's not going to encrypt everything on the drive. It's not going to pick every single file. It's very selective. Uh, with that, you can see a lot of your media files, so your pictures of your kids, uh, you know, your Java applications are going to stop working, uh, your database applications are going to stop working. There's all kinds of uh, lovely things it's going to encrypt, but I think one of my favorites is uh, if it finds wallet.dat, anybody know what that file would be? Bitcoin. Yes. You're cheating. Um, so uh, with that, uh, if you're... Bitcoins, I'm sorry. Um, so with that, uh, if you're familiar with the idea of uh, digital currency, uh, Bitcoins are a way to translate that. Um, and uh, presuming that you have uh, you know, a Bitcoin application on your machine, you'll have a wallet.dat. And so they're actually going to force you to go buy more if you will, uh, seek out more uh, to go pay them. Uh, so they're going to prevent you even from getting to that. So um, a very targeted attack in that regard. OK, on something like that, you said it would buy more. Is that right? You would, buy more. you would have to if you're going to pay the ransom. OK. So it basically it takes the buy. money out of your wallet, encrypts right. it, and makes you buy more money in order to get that money back. Okay. Exactly. Now, where are you yeah. getting it from? You're getting it from Bitcoin? Yeah. Bitcoin, yeah. So would yeah. that mean that Bitcoin has just uh, a percentage off of what? That would be awfully under table, and that would be very much a conspiracy. But you never know. Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin. You never know. Bitcoin is the only one you could get Bitcoin from. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is one of those things, that, and again, I would, I would agree with, with what you're saying, that Bitcoin is not part of the whole conspiracy or yeah. the like. What they're doing is the bad guys are making it so you can't get to your Bitcoins yeah. that you already own without buying additional Bitcoins. Then you'll be able to get yours back, assuming that the ransomware that you've got is by honest, respectable ransomware <laughs> authors. <laughs> <laughs> We laugh. No, but, it's true. It's very true. You know, every cop show you see when they talk about the kidnappers and the ransom, there's always the comment, well, they're probably already dead. <laughs> right. You know, are they going to live up to it? Are they going to? And there's, there's a certain amount here as well. Yeah, and I think that makes a very good point. One of the things that makes ransomware so effective is that folks have purchased uh, to unlock their machines, to get that key, to decrypt the machine, and it works. And so that becomes public information and it repeats. And so it becomes kind of a, well, you know, I need my kids' photos. I need all these things. I need these sensitive uh, spreadsheets and so on. I'm going to go ahead and pay it and get access to those files again. So uh, with that, um, you know, it, it becomes a, if you will, uh, kind of self-perpetuating uh, from a social standpoint. Generally, how much is the ransom? Is, is there a range? I mean, Very. Is, is general, it's general usually range? within reason. Yeah. Um, so, in other words, it's not going to be price, one million dollars. Customer service. <laughs> good marketing. <laughs> quality. I, yeah, I'm it's very true. Not it's very true. This really is, to me, at the heart of what makes this so nasty. Is it's a good, honest company, or a lot of them are good, honest companies, mm -hmm. given what they do. So a lot of them will size it based on how much data they see encryption and estimation of how big the mm -hmm. network is and all of that kind of fun mm -hmm. stuff. But they will make it because they want you to pay the money. Right, right. I, um, yeah, go ahead. You usually learn about Bitcoin the same time you learn about ransomware. <laughs> a lot of cases. We Very much. Too. We had no idea, and I got a quick education. It was a $5,000. They captured our Goodness. network, and it was exciting. We wanted to pay them so desperately. <laughs> but we had a duplicate of everything, and we said, go away. But uh, we were fortunate because we didn't know that this thing existed. But, but we were so overly cautious that we duplicated everything. Mm -hmm. And we, we didn't really, we lost maybe 15 minutes worth of stuff that didn't Excellent. Really matter. Yeah. So, Excellent. I, I think it's a real serious problem, a serious threat. But like I say, $5,000, it was tempting because it was mm -hmm. cheap and quick. Yeah. Solution. Yeah. But then the part of me that really hates crime said, no, nah, I'm not going to do this. Thing. Yeah. We, yeah. We can do it. Yeah, one of the correlations to kind of answer your question, uh, a single machine will often have more of a $200, $500 uh, kind of range, but a machine that's compromised with something that's network aware that actually goes out and encrypts stuff on the network, well, more likely you'll see a larger number. So there's metrics in there. There's intelligence built into that. So again, great customer service yeah. uh, for them anyways. Yeah. So CryptoWall, uh, just one interesting point about that uh, for the malware lovers in the room. Crickets, tumbleweed, um, is that uh, you know it will exclude various different places on uh, your machine and extensions to uh, exclude, so it doesn't ruin the machine. Um, and Crypto Wall in particular, this is the one I alluded to earlier. Um, it actually excludes, let's see, Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Belarus, Abraja, Abra, I can't even say that one. I won't say that one. Armenia, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Georgia. So it excludes all of those places with a presumption that uh, there might be some friends there. There might be uh, some folks who can't afford that, so there's no point. Uh, so you can see we start to uh, create those geographically. Um, and there are actually a few others since the slide deck has been made that focus on the US and Canada in particular. So, um, so at a raw level, uh, without touting Sophos products too much, um, really kind of a list of things that you can do. Uh, so we've already heard from the room itself, uh, back up your files. Have a good backup. Um, my, uh, the example I give for backups is my own father. Uh, my father was a pilot for almost 40 years. Uh, the joke was that you would have to put him in a simulator upside down, tear off two wings, and get rid of two engines for him to crash an airplane. Um, because that's, his idea was have a backup plan. Does your backup plan have a backup plan? What happens if that was my dad? 
And so I encourage IT departments maybe not to be that extreme, but go ahead and have a backup solution that is reliable, that is often tested. Uh, so assure that you can retrieve files from that backup solution. Um, I've had a few vendors uh, you know, where I've interacted with folks. Uh, Sophos doesn't at this point offer a backup solution, but I've, I've interacted with enough folks to say, uh, you know, the tape is dead or the whatever it is, and it's a horrible situation because they needed data from three years ago that's all on the tapes, and the tapes are bad. They got wet, they got wiped, they got whatever. Or lost, for that matter. I did work for an organization where we lost several boxes of tapes at one point off the back of a truck. So that wasn't good either. Um, a second would be don't enable macros. So with uh, malware like Locky coming in um, and then uh, turning on the macros, uh, will allow that to start executing on the machine. So uh, by policy, turn off uh, macros uh, in your uh, Microsoft Office uh, or comparable products uh, that you have out there. Um, this one, uh, Microsoft Office viewers, uh, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, as a front line, uh, the Microsoft Office viewers can initially open up a particular document, and then uh, you can choose to go ahead and edit that. Uh, they won't execute any kind of macros, uh, a limited feature set, and it's really kind of like your PDF viewer. So you're just going to look at the document, and a lot of times that might be all they need at the front end, depending on what a job role is, uh, who's doing that. Um, Educate your users about unsolicited attachments, and maybe yourself. You know, so again, the invoice from, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we'll get into uh, HD phishing here in just a minute. I'll explain that term. Uh, but uh, the, the world of uh, receiving emails and email attachments is getting uh, ever more, uh, if you will, accurate and, again, better advertising uh, for the users. Um, this is uh, probably one of my favorites. Uh, who in here has a bunch of users with admin rights? Come on, fess it up. Nobody has admin rights anywhere? I find it hard to believe. Some, some do. That's good. That's actually really good. Uh, but yeah, if you can limit uh, the number of folks who have admin rights to their machines, uh, even your administrators, you know, not typically day by day using administrative privileges unless they absolutely need them uh, for a particular task, uh, limit that capability uh, because we're not going to willy-nilly install malware that way, uh, those kind of items. Um, patch, patch like wild, uh, shut those doors. So again, uh, one of the analogies I've made historically, I live in a house that was built in 1881. It's got 26 windows, 26, that's a lot, um, and it has uh, seven doors. So uh, with that, if I leave those open, uh, then I am you know, really open to anybody, anywhere, uh, coming in uh, to my environment and doing whatever. And so you know, I have nice windows and nice doors with big locks on them uh, to keep that out. So we want to close out those possibilities uh, that we're just going to have folks entering in uh, to that. So if you don't have a good patching regimen already, I encourage you to evaluate that and also thoroughly evaluate what needs to be patched in the environment. Uh, I can think of a particular insurance company that I worked for in my past. Came in and found a, a particular document management software, uh, three versions behind and extremely vulnerable. Um, so uh, with that, that was an upgrade process. But that was a, a system that was by itself, rarely used by just a handful of people, um, sat with an internet connection and could have very easily been compromised at that time. So that was quite a few years ago, but that's an example of kind of an obscure item. So you're Microsoft Office stuff is, um, you know, probably broadly spread across the organization. That'd be your first target, and then start looking for some of those more obscure items to patch. Um, yeah, kind of finish out this slide too. Train and retrain your users. Uh, I worked for the eighth largest bank in the nation. Um, that was part of my responsibility, and it, I was astonished. Um, I dealt with, you know, everybody from bank tellers on up. Uh, they were unfortunately kind of the, the customer facing side of things and they needed a lot of information on what's acceptable. Um, and these days, uh, you know, with the USB style attacks, with other items, um, you know, not leaving your workstation open, those just some basics like that, teaching the users repeatedly um, because multiple exposures really help folks memorize things. I mean, that's uh, if you've ever gone through school or what have you, uh, you know, write it down twice read it twice, you know, multiple exposures, maybe different dynamics, get it from different people. 
because we all have different communication styles. So uh, some folks get it in writing real well, so you can send out the email and they got it right away. Other times they want to sit in a room like this and that's the way they get it really well. You might even have a few users you need to do one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so uh, with that though, really you know, train up folks, um, get them well educated there, um, and then you know, segment your network. So uh, if you have a, a really flat network uh, topology, uh, go ahead and segment out your servers, segment out your uh, workstation, your LAN, uh, VLANs, so on and so forth, uh, so that you can actually control uh, that traffic uh, thoroughly. So, um, a few shameless slides with Sophos, uh, really just to kind of show how we're catching this malware. So we've talked about the ransomware and the compromises, um, and how are we uh, handling that at Sophos? Um, really, uh, Who's heard of next-gen endpoint? Anybody heard that term? We've got a couple. All right. Uh, next-gen endpoint is very much uh, like any other advertising that goes on in the IT industry. Uh, the endpoint is dead. Long live the endpoint. We've got something better. Uh, Sophos has been doing this since about 2008 uh, in the fall, uh, where we're looking for more than just a defined set of malware. Computers are really good at saying, this is this book. But if you were to take that book and tear a page out of the computer and say, well, it's not that book anymore, even though you as a human go, well, it's the same book, it's just missing a few pages. Um, and that's more or less what we've done at Sophos is give our software the ability to go ahead and look at that book and say, there's enough of it that it is the same thing. Um, so at the very top here, uh, what we're seeing here is exposure prevention. So what is the user clicking on? Let's kind of watch what the browser is loading. And let's, uh, let's keep them away from sites that we know are compromised or outside of a category that we don't agree with, so on and so forth. Um, also be able to do download reputation. So that is a relatively new technology. Have we seen this file before? Have we um, analyzed this file? And it, does it come from a source that we know is uh, good, like Microsoft, let's say? It's a known good file from them. Um, so being able to uh, analyze that and then go ahead and we'll see about 80% of threats on a particular machine prevented by that. Another 10% um, by just using those heuristics. So uh, we've kind of looked through the file, what it's going to do. We don't like the look of that. Uh, it's kind of like the guy who's dressed in all black and he's got something that looks like it could be an analysis tool for gas lines or it could be a shotgun. He's walking around the back of your house where your kids are playing kind of doing that same kind of analysis that you're doing in your head. Hmm, I'm not sure I like this. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that same kind of analysis. And then just 5% are caught outright with signatures. So uh, everybody know what a signature-based anti-malware is? Excellent. I get to, I get to tell everybody. Uh, I get to corrupt everyone. So basically just uh, that definition that says this is this particular piece of malware. Um, as you guys can recall, 750,000 pieces of malware a day, that gets a bit laborious. So just 5%, hmm, not necessarily a good ratio. I'll show you what we're doing about that at Sophos here in just a second. So uh, runtime behavior, so we're actually examining how it's, how it's running. So you double clicked on it and it actually started to run and we're watching what it's doing and then we'll actually look for uh, exploit detection. And that's something that's about to grow in the product pretty greatly. In this next slide, maybe, maybe not. There we are. So coming this fall, uh, Sophos is going to kind of change how we look at things, actually add in another piece to all those pieces that you just saw um, and grow that out quite a bit. And uh, what you see here is a number of different exploits. I don't expect anybody to be able to read that. but. Uh, common exploits uh, throughout the year are released in the hundreds. So by that basically we're saying maybe there's hundreds of doors and windows by which you can get into a machine. Well, malware we're seeing about 750,000 a day. Which would you guys rather write code for? Hundreds or a year or 750,000 a day? Oh, I can tell you which our guys want to write code for. Um, so uh, what we've decided to do is really kind of the analogy, it goes back to the analogy I used earlier, uh, where we can actually look at those doors and windows until they close and say, um, we're not going to let anything bad through this. 
In fact, we're really not going to let anything through this because nothing should be coming through it. It should be using legitimate means. And so it's one more way that we can examine what's going on with the machine. Whereas traditional AV and malware, they're actually examining what's coming through the door. The door is open. Who's coming through there? Are they going to do me bad or are they going to do me good? And then either allow it or not, for that matter. So now we're just going to go ahead and say, hmm, that really doesn't belong in here. We're not letting anything through, if that makes sense. So uh, I really an yet another look. Uh, most folks don't realize that Sophos is a 30-year veteran of the AV industry. Um, so that's uh, uh, quite a long time. And we've continuously innovated our software to keep up with new threats. Uh, so we develop new tools. We migrate those tools into the product uh, and uh, develop new products on top of that. Um, with that uh, comes uh, the ability to actually uh, analyze threats in real time and then give you that feedback. So we have a cloud-managed AV. Uh, so the AV sits on your computer. You manage it from a web interface. And uh, we can give you information. So uh, right down here, uh, we can see the machine and who was logged in and when it happened and uh, what was done about it. We can make some notes for our administrators over here if we want to. And we can get even more detailed if we want to and totally geek out on this. And we can see here, if we, we, this bright red button right here uh, was when we started seeing things go wrong. And we started an analysis this way, going forward in time. But then we also started an analysis backwards. How in the world did this get here? Uh, so there's a registry key that got edited. And um, you know, over here, uh, tried to connect to an IP. And it tried to do various different items uh, to that. So again, uh, we have very thorough analysis tools coming this fall, where right in our cloud-based product, you can see what's going on with a particular machine and how we handle that. Um, especially if your b beef Wellington recipe might get compromised. Just proof that we have British people working at Sophos. So uh, we really don't want that compromised, obviously. But uh, threat analysis tools like that that gives us some idea of did it come across the network? Did it come across uh, via the internet connection that the person was using? Uh, did it start with a browser? Did it start with the USB stick? Um, those are the questions that right now in the history of IT security require a lot of analysis. Uh, you might have to go gather logs from a particular machine. You might have to go gather logs from a firewall. Uh, so on and so forth. Sophos is building an ecosystem based on the products that we have uh, today to be able to do that automatically, or automagically, as some folks call it, uh, where you can just go ahead and, and look at that threat and uh, examine what's going on uh, in real time. Um, any thoughts about any of that before I kind of change topics? I like the colors. <laughs> Here's the thing. I think it was uh, a little over two years ago, we were actually at a crossroads on security. We knew we had to change something. We were pretty much just doing, hey, antivirus, yay, good thing. Maybe the sonic wall should be updated. Yay, good thing. That was pretty much it. We knew we had to change. And honestly, we were ready to look for another vendor, uh, just simply because Sophos actually scales a lot of their pushes to larger organizations than what we deal with in their MSP program. Lousy. So, Getting better. I know. Oh, believe me, Scott. <laughs> Scott and I go way back. Nice, nice. But I went to their conference, and I figured I'm going to take a look, see what the see what the vision was, see what the view was, and you could see, and you can actually see it right here. They weren't saying we're going to make our antivirus better mm -hmm. at doing the same thing it's been doing because it's not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different approach that the bad guys are taking. There has to be a different approach, and it has to be more efficient. Because remember, at the same time that they're looking and seeing, is this a bad file, is this a bad file, is this a bad file, the user is banging on the keyboard going, why can't I open my file? Why is this thing so slow? It's not slow. OK? It's not. Tell that to the user. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear that. But it's, it's, there is a true. It's revolutionary. I don't use that term a lot, but it's a revolutionary change in terms of how they're approaching these layers and these levels of security. And I may be giving away the, as you go forward. It's the punctuation mark. We'll punctuation. get there. Okay. I got slides for that. All right, he's got slides for that. That's, Excellent. That's the key here that I think is, is you're starting to see. Yep. A little bit about phishing. So I've been alluding to that a bit as we go through here. Who knows what phishing is? It's not actually catching fish. It's catching people. 
Uh, d via email. Okay. Yeah, so you're getting an email that looks like something that you're expecting. Let's, uh, let's use an example here. So uh, when it comes to phishing attacks, um, I, and I think a lot of folks have experienced this by now. Uh, if not, you've had users who have experienced it. I, my my stepmom is an experienced, uh, very experienced with identifying phishing. She's 76 now. Um, so, uh, you know, with this, we're seeing a, an increase in the quality, and that's why I bring this particular so slide up. As uh, so, this one in particular is not in English, um, but uh, it is a good example. So uh, this is actually one of my favorite threat analysis folks here at Sophos. His name's Chest, uh, Chester. Um, and uh, with that, we're seeing the icon of the company. Uh, we're seeing really nice links, really good formatting. Um, and we're not seeing any misspellings. You know, somebody's spell checking now these and, and grammar checking. So despite this one being in French, which my French is terrible. Um, so, um, but over here we see Wells Fargo. And doesn't that look like a Wells Fargo email? You know, it's from info at wellsfargo.com, supposedly. And there, it's Chester again. And so, you know, look, up here we've got some links, just like we would on the website. We've got the logo, we've got the handsome guy, we've got, you know, a format over here. And, you know, hey, look, sign into an account online. And yet when we hover over that link, it has nothing to do with Wells Fargo. In fact, it might be 1L Fargo, Wells, 1L, so on and so forth. And Secondarily, what we see building on this is what we call HD phishing, is that high definition. Um, so in this case, um, what we're seeing is uh, with this uh, particular email is actually uh, information uh, that actually is for the user. So it has the user's name, it has various different elements uh, from a compromise. Uh, so some of it's been redacted and I forgot about that, but long story short, um, if I can compromise folks' names, I can go ahead and grab folks' names from LinkedIn. So if you're on LinkedIn, that's pretty easy. Uh, you should see some of the stuff that our CEO gets. It's actually pretty humorous. Um, by the way, our CEO is actually from Ohio, so you guys should all buy SoFo stuff <laughs> to support our CEO. Um, so, uh, but uh, with that, uh, really kind of a step up in combination. So uh, to go back, we're taking Wells Fargo concepts and now we're combining in personalized information to get to the HD phishing. So now it says, hey Matt, uh, you know, we noticed your account is compromised in this way. Uh, click here to sign in and go do this. Uh, legitimate organizations who know what they're doing will actually send you an email that says, just go to our website and log into your account as usual and handle the situation. Or give us a call, we won't even give you the number. And uh, that way they're communicating to you what a concern is, but they're letting you take the action to initiate that communication through the channel that you're familiar with and is appropriate for that organization. So for your organization, that might be a good suggestion uh, to implement. And uh, also from your experience, you be the one who initiates that uh, communication with the organization uh, when those situations come up. Um, and since you guys are uh, all here and security professionals, right? Right. Um, phishing frenzy. Uh, if you guys don't fish your own users, does anybody here fish their own users? Oh, come on. You guys are missing out on all kinds of fun. <laughs> I'm serious. You, you haven't lived. Um, so uh, about a year and a half ago, Sophos IT department started phishing our own users. And boy, is it a lot of fun to hear some of those stories. Uh, the very first one that was worth its weight anyways was, hey, the Sophos IT department, uh, in conjunction with our mobile control development team, have come up with a process by which you can test our new software for the Apple Watch. So uh, since you guys probably don't know, we, we make a software that controls your iPhones and your Android phones and so on. So it sounded awfully legitimate, but as we look at the link, as we start to look at the PDF, the PDF is calling home to a server that's on the internet and uh, it's asking for your username and password in the PDF. That seems a little weird. And uh, there's all kinds of things being plugged in there. Phishing Frenzy is a tool that can help you uh, do that. They can actually scrape off of a website elements uh, like your LinkedIn logo and things like that where you can convince the user. And so you can start to do some user education. You can uh, start to get feedback on who was compromised 
who is kind of fooled by some of those elements. You don't have to be quite as cruel as Sophos IT department, uh, you know, where we're all looking for our free Apple Watch. Um, but uh, you can start to see who might need some more education in your environment uh, for that. So, any thoughts about fishing before I fishing move on before to them? Why don't we take, because I know we've all eaten oh, all that it is. kind of thing, why don't we do about a five minute uh, bio break?